Okay, and uh, once more, apologies for those of us in the room. You'll have to hear this twice. I'm Dr. Kate Clark, and just wanted to clarify the plans for tomorrow. So as you'll hopefully see on your screen, please join us by Zoom uh, via the link here on your screen. New York. And if possible, <laughs> Please try to zoom in close to the, the Kelly Quigley quad so that you can also join us in person after some introductory remarks. So to clarify, the plan for tomorrow at 1230 is to join via Zoom, but then jump into in-person sessions. All students should have received several emails from me clarifying your choice of options for breakout conversations. This is all surrounding the development the next phase of the sustainability blueprint for campus for our next decade. Once more, join us by Zoom, but be ready to jump into in-person sessions tomorrow. With that, I'm pleased to first turn it over to Dr. Jeff Sellen, who will introduce our keynote speaker for this year's Spring Symposium on the theme of finding agency in the midst of disturbance. Thanks so much for being here with us today, y'all. The uh, School of Environment and Sustainability. Oh. Is that really allowed? Can I take that off? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I won't get close to anybody. Um, the School of Environment and Sustainability is so honored and pleased to have John Francis with us here for our spring symposium. Uh, we've been doing this for many years, and uh, we've had many great speakers, and uh, we are very much we, We're glad to have John here. And very much looking forward. No, we have a uh, Maybe, maybe uh, for those of you who are visiting by Zoom, could you please mute? Could you please mute? We're hearing a lot of people out there, I think, from the Zoom classroom. Sounds better. Um, so we are very pleased to have John Francis here. In 1971, uh, John found himself in on the California coast after uh, I, I've learned uh, going out there as part of a grand hippie movement uh, from Philadelphia. So he crossed the country and experienced an oil spill, which um, caused him to rethink his life at that point and take a very radical position as an American. Uh, he decided he would not travel by motorized transport as a result of that and contribute to the problem associated with the oil spill that he experienced. So he began walking uh, everywhere that he went. Um, and as a result of that walking, people questioned that. Um, didn't really seem like the normal American thing to do. And uh, as I understand it, uh, that caused you to take a vow of silence. You're just not going to talk to those people anymore. And uh, so at the age of 27, he took a vow of silence and did not speak for 17 years. Is that really true? I know it's uh, 17 years he did not speak. So that would take you up to the age of four, uh, 44, as I, as I count it. I think my math is right. Um, during that time, he founded Planet Walk. Uh, he went on to study in Oregon, in Missoula, Montana, and at Madison, uh, Wisconsin, where he got his PhD. And I believe, if, once again, if my math is right, that you did not speak as a graduate student. I find that hard to believe. Um, if there's one thing that graduate students learn to do, how else do they become professors, is to talk a lot. And uh, so it's amazing that you uh, went through your graduate programs without speaking. But here you are. Um, after he did start to speak again, he worked for the U.S. Coast Guard uh, as uh, um, oil pollution, uh, as a, as, uh, I think you were overseeing the Oil Pollution Act for the Coast Guard. Um, and, and since um, that time, he has walked across the United States more than once, I believe. Uh, he's walked in South and Central America, most recently maybe in Cuba, where he's been looking at uh, lots of interesting you know, environmental uh, aspects of what's happening in Cuba. And I, I think I've forgotten to say that all of these years where he was silent, he was soaking in um, the environmental issues and concerns of the world that he was walking through. And that prepared him to publish in 2005 his book, Planet Walker, How to Change Your World One Step at a Time. 
And I think that title, as much as anything, suggests why we have him here to speak to our um, spring symposium, uh, which is themed Finding Agency in the Midst of Disturbance. It's hard to find agency. Uh, Mr. Francis has found ways to do that, and I think we're very, um, uh, very much ready to hear about his experience and how he, how he did uh, pull that off. So once again, welcome to Gunnison. Welcome to Western Colorado University, John Francis. <clears throat> well, um, thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you all for, for being here, especially during this time of COVID. I'm just so happy to be here because uh, this is the my first my first uh, journey outside of my home in, in uh, Cape May, New Jersey. So this is uh, in over a year, in over a year, and I'm sitting because I'm coming from sea level <laughs> to 7,700 feet. That's like, and I know that if I get up and start walking and dancing around, uh, I'll probably fall down, and you'll have to come down and help me. So I'm going to start just with a little bit of <clears throat> banjo because um, I carried this banjo with me. And this is, this is that banjo <clears throat> that I carried uh, uh, across the United States and the length of South America. Um, in South America, I fell and I, it did break something up here and I had to get it repaired. But uh, it's over 100 years old, so there's some some uh, history to this, and it was made in Philadelphia. This banjo was made in Philadelphia. <laughs> I'll play a little more of that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, when, when I finish, I'll play a little more. But I, I like to start off with, with music um, because uh, in 1990, when I started speaking, it's the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. And um, after 17 years of not speaking, every year on my birthday, which was the 23rd of February, I would ask myself if I was going to start speaking again. And one 23rd of February, I said, you know, it's time for me to start speaking. And I couldn't imagine, uh, I didn't know what I was going to say, really. And I didn't know where I was going to say it or when I was going to say it. But I knew I had something to say. And so I chose Earth Day because I wanted to remind myself um, that what I wanted to speak about was the environment. And for me, the environment had changed. Um, I know you heard I started out because I saw an oil spill uh, and I was very passionate about that, uh, giving up riding in cars and, and not speaking, but the environment 
had become more than just about pollution to me after walking across America. And I want to say this before because it's the most important part of what I have to say, I believe, that I discovered that environment was really about people and people were part of the environment. And when I stopped to go to school and I stopped several times to go to school and we talked about environment, it was, oh yeah, people are part, are part of the environment. We're, we're, we're part of it. And I heard that and, uh, and it, it made me wonder at some point that if people were part of the environment, I mean, if we are really part of the environment, we're studying environment, we're, we care about the environment, but if we're part of it, and we're really thinking about sustainability and resilience, then how we treat each other is our first opportunity to treat the environment in a sustainable way or even figure out what we mean by sustainability. And I want to say that again. If we're part of the environment, then how we treat each other is our first opportunity to treat the environment in a sustainable way or even understand what we mean by sustainability. So after 17 years of not speaking, I had this opportunity to speak again. I realized that. And so on Earth Day, I chose to, to to gather some friends and my family came to Washington, D.C. And uh, they, they were there to hear me say my first words. National Geographic came. Uh, the, the newspapers came from the California, the Los Angeles Times sent someone. And uh, my first words, and everyone wants to know, what were your first words, John? My first words were, thank you for being here. Those are my first words tonight to you. Thank you for being here because if you weren't here, and, and I mean all of you in Zoom land too, if you weren't here, there would be no communication. And what I learned about communication when I was silent was that it really does take two of us to communicate. It really does. It takes someone to send a message and someone to receive the message. And so for 17 years of not speaking, I was attuning myself to just receiving all the messages I possibly could from all the people that I encountered, the hundreds, the thousands of people that I encountered. I'd have to say I was also attuning myself to receive the message from just the natural world, which we were all a part of. We're all a part of that. Well, thank you for being here. I said that and my mother jumped up and I like to say that because it reminds me of how my mother was and who she was. I know that she's in me right now. So I said, thank you for being here. My mother jumps up. She goes, hallelujah, Johnny's talking. <laughs> and I just couldn't imagine, you know, it's like, oh my God, my mom. And it's like, mom, sit down, please don't. No, but I was so happy that she did that. She jumped up. And she said, hallelujah, you know, my son is talking. You know, that's, and my dad, he just kind of looked at me. <laughs> Mothers and fathers are different. You know that, right? Well, my dad just looked at me and he said, that's one. And he said that's one because he always wanted me to start speaking after I shut up. He said, you, you got to speak, you got to speak. And the next thing he wanted me to do was drive cars. You have to ride in cars. You have to ride in cars. Because he followed me across the United States, uh, and he would say those two things. Whenever I graduated from college, he would come and say, you know, we're, we're so proud of you, son. You, you, you've gone to college here. You've, you've got your bachelor's degree. And, and you did it all without, without speaking. And you also did it without asking us for money. We like that part. <laughs> but what are you going to do with a bachelor's degree if you don't ride in cars and talk? You don't ride in cars and talk. And I didn't know. 
because I got my bachelor's degree. I have to tell you, I just wanted to get it out of the way because I had tried before and I dropped out of college and I told my parents, I said, look, don't worry about me going to school. I'll do that in my own time and I don't want you guys to pay for it. So my dad said, when he heard me say, thank you for being here, I was talking. He said, that's one. Now, I heard myself speak and this is, this is, I, I like to say this story because it's so, I heard myself speak and I went, I didn't know it was me that was speaking. I hadn't heard myself in such a long time. I turned around and looked to see who was saying what I was thinking. And that's when I realized that was me speaking. You just heard yourself speak. And I thought that was so funny. I started to laugh. I was, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and my dad's still looking at me and he's going, yeah, he really is crazy. <laughs> Look at him up there laughing like that. Well, I went on and I, I read something from, uh, it was uh, Linton Caldwell, a philosopher, uh, environmental philosopher, and he was writing about environment, about how environment was um, really a matter of state of mind and the being. It was pollution and loss of species and loss of habitat were all important issues, but that it was really about who we were and who we were and who we needed to become to survive. And he thought it was a, 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 a matter of, of spirit, a spirit. That was what the environment was to him. And he, what he said kind of, I took that with me a lot across the country. I felt that as well, that it, it, there's something that I'm not seeing that environment's about. Well, if environment is about how we treat each other, then what does that mean? And I thought about it and I said, well, it, if we oppress one another, if we exploit each other, what, what happens in our physical environment is that that oppression, that exploitation manifests in the physical environment around us. And it looks like pollution, or it looks like loss of habitat, or it looks like climate change, or it looks like pandemic. I was like, wow, this, I have to start telling people this story. I have to let people know that the walk across this, this country, the stopping to, to study in the academic institutions across the, to get all the way from a bachelor's all the way up to a PhD, I figured something out. <laughs> and so now I had something to say. And everyone would say, when are you gonna talk? And it's like, well, I got something to say. <laughs> Well, now I have something to say, and I want to say it now, right now, because this is what's important. Environment is about human rights. Environment is about civic rights, civil rights, gender equality, economic equity. Environment is about all the ways we, we relate to each other. It's about kindness. It's about how we care for each other. If we can care for each other, we can care for the environment. So let me go back to where this start and, and kind of, how did I get on this journey? You know, and that's what I wanna talk about. This moment of obligation, what we call this agency, this moment of obligation for me is what, I didn't know anything about moment of obligation. What does that mean? It wasn't until I got to the University of Montana and I started researching and studying and looking at philosophy that I came upon uh, a philosopher, his name was Henry Bugby, and he studied and he was teaching in, uh, at Harvard. But for some reason, he wanted to come out and live in Montana, and so he started teaching in, at the University of Montana in Missoula. And he wrote a, he wrote a paper called uh, The Moment of Obligation and Experience. And I was able to read this paper and I was like going, oh, I, I know, I see what he's saying, I know what he's saying. And 
when I, before I started this journey, um, I was uh, a kind of a, a, a regular guy, I guess, uh, in the um, African American community. I was just uh, uh, trying to fit in, trying to, to, to be like everyone else, not to be noticed too much. And so I had this, this proclivity of making things up to try, and, to try and make myself other than I was, to try and fit in, to try and be better or, or to try and impress someone and try to come up with, uh, oh, what do you do? How do you do today, John? Oh, I'm doing fine. Uh, you, I see you playing the banjo. Oh, yeah, I got a record contract coming up. You know, of course I wouldn't have a record. Uh, but I would say things like that. I would, I had this uh, way of trying to pump myself up. I guess you'd call it lying. <laughs> and I did that a lot. I mean, I did that. I did it so much. I did it so well. I think I was trying to be so many different things that I forgot who I was. I mean, who the real person was, who, who Johnny Francis was. And... Uh, when I saw this oil spill, I turned to my friend who I was, uh, my girlfriend at the time, who happened to be a Standard Oil heiress. Her name was Jean Lohman, was a Standard Oil heiress in, in uh, California. And I said to her, I said, this oil spill, look at this oil spill. She said, you know, that's just, it's just a, a, a kind of a, she thought it was a kind of a, a an act that someone had done on purpose to get back at her family. <laughs> I was like, talk about conspiracy theories. <laughs> and I said, well, look, let's, you know, we have to do something about this. She said, well, what do you want to do? I said, um, let's just give up riding in cars. Ah, <laughs> she said, um, and I'm going to use her voice on this. It's not really her voice, but it, it's, it, it's, it's a theatrical, you know, thing here. I said, Gene, I think we ought to give up riding and driving in cars. She looked at me and she goes, that's nice. <laughs> now, she didn't really sound that way at all. <laughs> she didn't sound that way at all. But she said, that's nice, John. And, I, and she said, but we can't do that because to do something like that, We'd have to have a lot of money. We don't have enough money to do that. I said, yeah, I guess you're right. And th that's where my mind was. You have to have a lot of money to do what's in your heart. Like something like walk everywhere. You need a lot of money. When you think about it, it's like, well, maybe you wouldn't need very much money to walk everywhere, <laughs> but you need a lot of money if you wanted to drive everywhere. Regardless of that, it wasn't until a friend who was a deputy sheriff, uh, a deputy sheriff in, in our little town of Inverness in California, was in a boating accident and was lost. His mother lived up the road from us and I went up to say we were sorry that her son had um, passed away. I mean, he was had a, a house, picket fence, the wife, babies, and he was living the American dream. He had a good job. He was a deputy sheriff. And uh, he would always get after Jean for growing this plant in her yard, though. But that's legal now. <laughs> wasn't back then, you know, and people got into a lot of trouble. But anyway, we decided that we were going to go for a walk to celebrate Jerry's life. And it was on that walk that um, I realized that Jerry and I were about the same age. And the next time I saw Jerry, I didn't see him again. I never saw him. I saw him like the night before. And then I never saw him ever again. And it made me understand that life and death were intertwined and that there was no promise that I would get up tomorrow. There was no promise that we would get the money we needed in order to give up riding and driving in cars, that we could 
walk once we got this money. And so it was that moment that I decided where we had walked all the way from Inverness to oh, San Rafael to, to a nightclub that we were going to dance. We were going to dance in this nightclub. It was that moment. So it wasn't more than a moment. It was like a few hours. It was a day because on the way back, walking back to our, to our home in, in Inverness, it was a 20-mile walk one way and 20 miles the other way. But walking back, I was saying, you know, I'm just going to keep on walking. I'm just going to keep on doing this because I'm already walking. And there's no guarantee that the money's going to come or next week I'm going to start doing this. I'm doing it now. I'm just going to keep doing it. And uh, Jean said, well, that's good, you know, but I have so much other things to do, so many things I can't do. I still love you, John, though. You know, I, I, sometimes I say, she said, bye. <laughs> she was not that cold. Um, we still, you know, loved each other. And um, we still remained friends. But at some point, I decided I had to walk. And I continued walking. And I walked uh, all the way up to Oregon. You know, and that was like 500 miles. And I turned around and walked another 500 miles back. And it was like, that's the first time I went on a walk. And I had to carry a banjo with me because uh, it was just something to do. Just something to do. So there's that moment. Something happened where... I decided I was going to give up riding in cars. And Bugby talks about this moment. Bugby talks about this moment of obligation in experience is that it's when we come to a situation, when a situation presents itself and we are touched in such a way that we have to act, that we have to do something. And what it entails is knowing who you are, that you have to know that you're this person and you have to do this thing. And it defines you. You are defined by this action, this moment. And you're obligated, not because someone says, you have to do this, young man. It's, you're obligated because you are obligated. You feel this obligation. You understand who you are and you must do this act in order to be true to that self. And for me, this person who was hiding and lying and being an everybody thing and everything else, but who I really was and who I couldn't find that, I didn't know who that person was. This was a moment that was like a bright light that said, I know who you are now. I know who you are, you're this person. And I couldn't put that away. I couldn't give that up. I wouldn't give that up. And so I continued to walk. That was the choice that I made, to continue to walk. And what happened was, why I stopped speaking was because, well, people just woke up in the morning. They said, you know, John's walking everywhere. Come on. You know, we want to go to play volleyball in Point Reyes Station. He won't drive with us. He'll walk over there. It take, it's four miles there. It takes us five minutes to get there. It takes them a whole hour. And when I got there, I would be out of breath. <sighs> and they would be, okay, ready to play? <laughs> and everybody would pile in their car and they would drive home again. I would be stuck in Point Ray Station. Well, I wasn't stuck. It was just, that was my life. That became my life. And people started arguing with me, John, you're not going to make a difference. And I'd argue back, oh, yeah, I guess I am. And then one day, I realized. One day, I realized that I didn't know what I was saying. I was saying I could make a difference. But I didn't really understand whether I could make a difference or not. And so what I did was I decided that I wasn't going to speak on my birthday. That's the 23rd of February. I was going to give it up for one day, just one day. If I knew it was 17 years, it might have been different. <laughs> the one said, well, you're going to, how long are you going to not speak? For one day, that was, the, that was the deal. But that one day of not speaking, I learned so much. The first thing that I learned was I had not been listening. 
I was always ready to say something. I would listen just enough to think I knew what someone was going to say to me. And then before they finished, I started formulating my argument in my head. So I never really heard what they said. And then when they finished and they the opportunity for me to speak, I launched into my argument, which may or may not have anything to do with what they eventually said. So for that first day, I didn't speak. I listened to people. I realized that, gosh, I had not been listening. And it was a kind of a happy moment and a sad moment because the happy part of it, or the sad part of it was that I had lost all these years, all this opportunity of learning from all the people that I had met. The happy part of that was that I could do this another day and I could learn some more. And so I did it another day. Whoa, well, there you go, down that rabbit hole, John. Because <laughs> after I learned some more, I said, I, sh I should just shut up and keep learning. And so it was a week later before people really started to get worried. You can imagine in your community if, you know, you decide that you're just not going to talk. And people got really scared. People got frightened. And people thought that, oh, my gosh, John gave up riding in cars. Now he's not talking. And now this is California, and they were, that weed was, though it was illegal, a lot of people imbibed in that. And uh, they got to different realities. So they came up with this idea that was a sign for the Aquarian age. That's what it was. It's the Aquarian age. John is not talking. Some people thought, well, no, no, it's not that. It's the end of the world. John has given up talking. He's not talking. He's not riding in cars. Some people just said, no, John is just crazy. And um, I just left, they just left me to myself. And uh, I had to write my parents and, and let them know that I wasn't going to call my mother and, and father. And, you know, I'd call them once a month and let them know that I was okay. But that I had given up talking because I decided I wasn't going to speak for a year, just a year. And on my birthday, I would, you know, probably figure out how I could do this again, how I could start speaking again. Uh, my mother wrote me and she said that your father will be on the next plane uh, from Philadelphia. And so he did fly out and um, he so kept, caught me walking up the road one place that Gene had gone to the airport and picked him up. And I had my banjo and, you know, he saw me and I was not dressed as a, a, a Philadelphia son should be dressed. Uh, with a banjo and patches and uh, he said son he opened the door he said son and I was so happy to see my dad I shook his hand and I was so happy to touch him because I hadn't touched him in a long time and he said it's so good to see you and I said and a big frown came over his face because I didn't say it was good to see you a big frown came over his face and it, and I could feel his his hurt inside me. And uh, I ended up going to a, a, a the, we call it the Botel, it was on the water. I ended up going to the Botel with him and, and uh, communicating with him. He said, come on, get in and we'll drive to the Botel. And I said, Gene said, it's okay, John, he'll walk. He was kind of hurt that I wouldn't get in a car. Because this was now becoming a reality for him, a reality for him, not only for him, but for me, because I'm, this is circling back to my family. And that's like, John, you're really on this journey. You're really on this journey. He called my mother and he said, you know, um, the people here seem to like him. And my mother said, can you bring him home? And he said, I don't think this would work in Philadelphia. And so he said, we best, we just leave him here. So they left me in California to uh, learn the banjo and to uh, learn about the environment, which is uh, they understood that I had given up riding in cars because of an oil spill, which they thought that wasn't going to make any difference. And so the next few years, 
I spent walking up and down the, the California coast and going into wilderness areas and, um, and just learning to be in, in the environment, learning to, to live in the wilderness, uh, learning to be with people and not speak, um, learning to play music, uh, learning to listen, learning to listen. And uh, when I came out of the wilderness, I went and I lived in the wilderness for a year and I had a girlfriend who lived with me and we both came out and she went to school in Southern California and I went to school in Oregon. We both looked at education as a, as a very important part of our journey. She didn't speak with me. We always signed, we use sign language, and, uh, which is very different from Vipassana. When it's a, if any of you know about Vipassana where you, you are silent for 10 days and you don't speak, you're not communicating with anyone, you're totally inside. And uh, when I came out, I went to school uh, and I wanted to learn about environment. And back in that time, at that time, there was only one book you could study. It was Living in the Environment and it was uh, edited by Tyler. And I, I read that book, I took a course in class and. And one day I discovered that you could actually study environment. I was so pleased, I was so surprised. And at Montana, you could study environment if you could take the GRE, you had to take the GRE. And I took that GRE and it was just, I got such a headache, I don't wanna take a test like that ever again. And I made application and they said, you, you're in, you can come to the University of Montana. And when, when are you gonna get here? And I said, well, I wrote, I'll get there in two years because I have to walk and I have to, it was a boat I was building in Washington. So two years later, you can read about all the stories and stuff in Planet Walk and I kind of seen it going around, floating around there. Yeah, you can read about those stories, lots of stories, but we, we don't have that much time. Um, but I did get to Montana two years later and they said, John, are you ready to uh, go to school? And I did this, which was my sign for, you don't have any money. And they said, that's okay, we're gonna take care of it. Now, uh, this is another one of those stories I like to tell because, you know, how are we gonna get through without the help of others? We can't, we can't make it and these are people at the University of Montana who really wanted to see me um, go to school there. If I was gonna walk all the way from California to go to school there, they wanted to see me study at the, uh, their environmental studies program. So they said, look, what we've worked out is that you're a resident of Montana because two years ago you said you were coming here and by now you're a resident of Montana. So you're gonna get in-state tuition. Um, we're gonna give you, here's a hundred dollars we want you to go over and register right now for uh, uh, two, two credits, uh, reading and conferencing, and that way you can matriculate here and you can have a key to your office. You're a graduate student, and graduate students, they get an office, right? Oh, <laughs> well, we got offices and we got it. We just got a desk in, a, in an office building. And uh, you get a key to your office and you can use the library. And what we've worked out with all the professors that you need to take courses from is that they're gonna let you take the course without registering. And they're gonna let you take the exam and they're gonna put the grade aside and we figure out how to get the money for you. Then you're gonna register for those courses and they're gonna give you the grade that you got. Financial aid, I had never heard like that before. <laughs> and uh, I'm so appreciative of that. And that's the story that I'm telling you that even when you think you know what's going to happen in the future, you don't know. Even when you say, I, this, I can't possibly do this because I don't have this, I don't have that. It shouldn't stop you from doing what you need to do because you don't know the doors that are going to open in front of you. You don't know the people that are going to be there that are for you. My parents came out to see me graduate. And my dad says, I just don't understand how you do this. We're, I, I, I want you to know we're proud of you, but how do you go to school? How do you go to graduate school? You don't talk and, and you get this degree and people like you. 
There must be some secret. I think it's how we treat each other. What are you going to do with a master's degree? You don't ride in cars and talk. I hunch my shoulders and I grab my backpack, pick up my banjo and I go on. I walk all the way to, to South Dakota. And in South Dakota, I started working as a printer. I get a job as a printer. And I started looking, thinking about, you know, many of my colleagues, my fellow students, they are going on to get PhDs. I just did not believe I could get a PhD, not talking. I said, ah, oh, you know, this is something I can't do. It was hard enough to get a master's degree. But to get a PhD without speaking, nah, I'm not even going to bother. Oh, maybe I will write a little letter and ask something. You know, I did. I wrote all the way to many, many universities. And I wrote to the University of Wisconsin. And they said, um, we would like you to come and, and visit our school. And uh, people said that if you don't get accepted here, you're not going to get accepted anywhere. So we want you to come to our school. And so that's what happened. I walked to Wisconsin. And it turned out that my major professor had written on oil spills the Exxon, not wasn't the Exxon, it was the, the Santa Barbara oil blowout in 1969, which is what prompted the start of uh, Earth Day and the environmental movement. And I was there for two years writing my dissertation and studying and doing um, coursework. Uh, wasn't, I'm taking my exams and uh, my dad came out uh, when I finished my final exams and I was going back to uh, continue my walk on. He just said, I don't know how you do it, John, but you have a bunch of keys. And that means something. <laughs> I had keys to laboratories and offices. And uh, I wrote on oil spills and my colleagues who were with me at that time said, uh, John, why are you writing on oil spills? I mean, nobody's interested in oil spills. And no one was. This was in 1989. But uh, in March of 1989, something happened to just change everything, and I had no idea it was going to happen. It was Exxon Valdez, you know, in March of 1989. It was a, a, a big oil spill, and everybody saw it, and everybody wanted to know about oil spills. And there was only this one person in the United States who was studying oil spills at a PhD level, and that person was the Coast Guard called. Yes, we want to speak to John Francis. He's, what? He doesn't speak? Oh, oh, that's, that's too bad. I'm so, well, sorry. Um, but we want him to come out to Washington and work with the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 staff. And uh, what? He, he only walks. Uh, uh, Pardon me, ma'am, but are there any normal people at your school? <laughs> so um, my major professor, John Steinhardt, he, he fielded all those questions. And um, I continued my walk east. And uh, I got all the way to uh, New Jersey, where I ended my US walk. And I got on my bicycle and would ride to this is what I would do. And when I got someplace, I would ride a bicycle around and do everything. And then when I was ready to go, I would walk to the next place. And so this is, brings us back to, and I don't want to go over time where we are already, but um, back to where we are right now um, in uh, <laughs> back in, in Washington, D.C., where I have started talking, right? I started talking. And um, I'm talking because I, I have something to say, and it's about how we treat each other and uh, how that manifests in the environment and how kindness is a big part of that. I've, I've walked through red states, blue states, purple states. I don't know what color states. I mean, and when I say that uh, my parents would be just frightened of the places and the people that I've spent my years with, um, I'm not joking. And it's like, but those people were, were, were able to take care of me. They just took care of me. And, and, I, and, and so I, I have this really 
uh, amazing feeling for America and for the people who we are. And I think that we deserve to take care of each other. We deserve this, uh, to be kind to one another. Um, so I started talking and uh, I had a hard time talking. Things were coming out of my mouth kind of a jumbly. And so I would stop, I stopped talking, just went to different people individually and, and spoke to them. And after that was all over, I got on my bicycle because I had a, an appointment to meet with a deaf president, a deaf president at um, Gallaudet College. And I got on my bicycle. I'm, I'm going to end with this story. Uh, and I started riding to Gallaudet. And I was like, now I'm talking. I'm going to go meet with the deaf president, the first deaf president at Gallaudet. Wow, that's pretty crazy, John. And I'm riding. And all I can see out of the corner of my eye, a car coming. And boom, next thing I know, I wake up on the, you know, on the street and these people are over, over me. And this one guy leans over me and he says, listen, don't worry about anything. I work for a lawyer. And I said, I, I must be dead. I, you know, because why is this guy telling me this? You know, not to worry. And the ambulance comes and they, you know, they cut my shirt and they put me in a thing and they, put me on the ambulance and I go, oh my God, I started talking and now I'm going to go for my, this is my first car ride in like 17 years. This is crazy. This is terrible. And there I am and I'm tied down and I, I can't move my arms. And I realized that, oh, I can talk. <laughs> I can talk. And so I say to the MT, the EMT, I said, um, uh, ma'am, uh, where are we going? <laughs> and she says, looks at me and she goes, oh, honey, you, you've been in a bike, a car accident. Somebody hit you with a car. And I said, oh yeah, she says, we're taking you to the hospital. I go, oh, oh, okay. Um, where is the hospital? She says, it's, you know, you just rest. It's five minutes away. We're, we're going to drive you there. Um, at Howard University Hospital. And I listened to her and I'm, I'm, things are going around quickly in my head and I'm going, how am I going to get out of this, this ride to the hospital? And I, I say to the EMT, I said, um, you know, I, I think I can walk. <laughs> <laughs> and she stops and she goes, what do you mean you can walk? I said, well, I mean, I think I can, I can walk to the hospital, you know, and she says, why, are you afraid of cars or something? And I go, no. She says, what's it, against your religion or anything? Uh, I said, no, no. She says, well, why, why don't you ride in the car? Is it, a, is it principles? I, I said, yeah, that's what it is. It is it's principles. That's what it is. It's principles. And she says, oh. She says, well, look, honey, if you can suspend your principles for five minutes, we can drive your butt to the hospital. <laughs> I don't think principles work that way. She says, what, what is, what's going on with you? And I said, well, look, I haven't been in a car for like, you know, 17 years, over 17 years. And she said, 17 years, you haven't been in a car? I said, no. And she said, I said, look, I didn't talk for 17 years either. I, I just started talking yesterday. And then they started talking about St. Elizabeth <laughs> for the psychiatric ward. <laughs> well, they made me sign some papers and they let me go. But it was, it was touch and go there for a moment. And when I stepped out of the, the ambulance, there was that guy who worked for the lawyer. And he was there and he went, oh, no, you're ruining it. You're ruining it. And <laughs> I, I just said, uh, well, look, I just have to get my bike someplace and then I can get to see my uncle. And so he walked me to an attorney and uh, the attorney, that's a whole nother story. And, and I, I think that's in the Planet Walker. That's in Planet Walker. It's about um, them not believing anything that I said, <laughs> that I didn't talk or that I walked everywhere. Um, but uh, this is amazing things happen. People appear and 
the idea of working and doing something for the environment that you 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 make one step and another step and another step and you discover things that maybe you hadn't really thought of before i discovered that it was really about how we treated each other it wasn't until I, a few days later i was i found myself um, being hired by the, the U.S. Coast Guard to help write the regulations for the United States. And I can only imagine that if someone had told me, John, if you just give up riding in cars, if you just give up riding in cars, and if you just start walking east, you're going to really make a difference in the environment. And as I walked a little bit, and shut up too. And you're really going to make a difference. I would have thought maybe they had been, you know, sampling some of that weed that was now legal to grow and legal to sample. But that's what happened, you know. I mean, that's just the kinds of things that happen when you're on your journey. And those are the kinds of things that are going to happen for you when you find your moment of obligation and you're on that journey. And so I'm going to end with this music, which is, you heard a little bit about the music, what I started with, but this is where it is, uh, what it has brought me to. And this is life celebration, but it is uh, the end of life celebration and the beginning of something else. And I, and I don't have the words for it. I only have these notes. Thank you very much, and and um, I I think we have uh, enough time for just a few questions, and so I'll try to. Uh, I have on a little hearing challenge here, so we might have to repeat them a couple of times, but I'll try my best to answer any questions that you might have. John, this is John Houseburger. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, I'm driving, so I'm sorry if I break up. You talked the other night about okay. how that level of silence and that length of time with silence introduced you to what you called an altered reality. What do environmental issues look like through that altered reality? Could you share a bit about what that reality is and, and how it changed how you thought about those issues? Yeah, I think it's about altered reality. And yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it's really interesting because I had no idea that these things are going to happen. Um, when I stopped speaking, um, I had an idea of what not speaking meant. And um, I had an idea about what um, listening is about. And, but I didn't really understand um, that we, when we do something like that, like not speak, that there are a lot of different neurons and, uh, you know, uh, ways that w things that we use, parts of our, our body and, and mind that we use when we do speak so that we stop using that. We stop doing those things and, and something else comes in, in, in its place. And for me, it was this, um, altered reality and it was like um that i was uh, i had been on a trip or that i had uh, you know smoked all the weed that i could possibly ever smoke and and that something was real but i hadn't it was just this was just the natural um my my natural the natural uh, uh, experience that i think people have if they they go on these kinds of journeys and so um, for me, I saw things differently, uh, and, and I give you an example of one of the things that I saw that was very different for me. It was once I was stopped by some, uh, some people on a, on a, on a deserted road, it was a deputy, uh, off-duty deputy sheriff, and uh, he and his uh, partner, they stopped a truck, and they called me over, and I went over, and I knew this was, something was up, and they put a gun to my head. It was a, a, a gun. They said, uh, you know, we don't like, and they said the N-word uh, here. And, uh, and I just like looked at them all. They all looked familiar to me. I couldn't understand what, what, why they were so familiar. And in the process, while this was all going on, I recognized, I said, I know who they are. It, it was, the, they were death. It was death there and death is obviously familiar to us because death is so much a part of life without death we couldn't be doing this this would not exist and so um i saw them as uh death not like oh they represent death but in that place i they were death and what i thought at that moment was i usually make a painting every day uh, that was a practice. And I thought, darn, I hadn't made my painting today. <laughs> and while this, you know, racism and everything else is swirling around me, um, it was that I had made my painting. And, and when they asked me where I was going and I pointed that way and made my, my foot, you know, they just looked at me like, what? <laughs> and, and I said, well, well, get going. And, and, and so I started walking and I was thinking, well, am I going to hear the gunshot? I mean, that's a, and that turned around, they were gone. I sat down right away and I started doing my painting. <laughs> yeah. So in an alter reality, um, things that I would have seen differently um, in the, the way that I had been before, I saw completely different, completely different. And so as walking across the country and the experiences that I had with people and um, the love I felt for people and the love that people, we, that we felt for each other was something that perhaps is the altered reality that I experienced. And so that when I can say, it's really about how we treat each other. Of course, that's not where we understand. We don't understand that yet. And this is something that I'm saying to you and that uh, you may understand it, then you have to go out and and explain that, or you have to um, you have to practice that, you know. 
And so all the science and everything that we are doing in, in uh, environment is all equally as important. You know, we still have to, you can't stop doing that. You can't, uh, you, but you have to do it also with the, that, understand that the foundation of who we are is that we need to uh, be kind to each other and we need to look after each other and how we either we succeed at doing that is going to be how we succeed at at um, sustainability and resilience in the environment. I can shout it out. Uh, so throughout your book, you have, you have a lot of unorthodox experiences that are outside the norm for most people, I would say. Uh, your experience with Mr. Death, uh, your experience with uh, a minor family that caught you on guard. You have like preconceived notions of what they might be like, and you end up becoming really good friends with uh, the, the minor couple. Here's these experiences that you have on the road and, and literally in the streets of the U.S., did they give you any valuable skills that you carried into your academic career? Uh, these non-orthodox experiences, did they provide you with a different insight? Uh, or, or, or skills that benefited you when getting your graduate degree and later on your PhD, uh, and even working with the Coast Guard. So your first experiences, Really great question. Um, in my academic life, my major professor, for example, said in all his academic life, he'd never run into a student like me. And he said he felt as though he'd been waiting his whole life for me to show up so I could be his student. And uh, I felt that way. So, you know, I hadn't a teacher like that. And I felt the same way. Um, there was some, uh, it, it worked both ways. One, because uh, some people did not like the fact that I didn't talk, that I was doing what I was doing. And some people just uh, relished that. They was thought that was just the, that's what we needed. That's what we, we needed students like that. And um, there were professors who, who just did not like me and uh, would like to fail me. And I was fortunate enough to when I got into the uh, academic for my PhD to be um, to, to like being taken under someone's wing and say, look, you don't want to go here. You don't want to do that. You wanted to go this way because this person is going to try to derail you. And uh, my, eventually my, my major professor who had been working in the Nixon White House as a, as a geologist and uh, studied uh, science and government uh, and wrote that book, right, the, the blowout, you know. He said to me, John, he says, um, it's gonna be hard, but you're gonna need this PhD. You know, he said, because I can guarantee you, and I can, you're not going to change. It's not going to change your message. You're, you're not going to, he says, but the people are going to, that you need, that need to hear this, they won't listen to you unless you have these letters after your name. And I, I was kind of shocked. I was like, oh, no, you know, come on. And, and some, in some cases, that's true. You know, in some cases, that's true. But, um, I got hired at the Coast Guard, and my, my first day there, uh, I talked to my boss. I'm talking now, right? <laughs> I could talk. <laughs> and I, it might have been more difficult if I hadn't been speaking. Um, but I didn't ride in cars yet. Uh, I've still, everything was on a bicycle. I'd come home on a bike, and um, my, my boss, I asked him, I said, uh, Norm, why did you hire me? And he, and he said, well, um, besides being published in, 
and in the oil spill intelligence or in my data being used. He said, well, um, I told him, I said, you could, you could get, he says, you had a PhD. And I said, yeah, but you could get somebody else with a PhD. You know, you didn't have to get a crazy person with a PhD. I could talk to him like that. He says, yeah, you know, he says, you didn't talk for 17 years and, and, you know, you didn't ride in cars. You don't ride in cars. He says, uh, but the, the last time I look, the last time I looked, John, he says, they weren't giving that away, PhDs away. You have to know something. So he says, I figure you know something. And he said, and here we've been doing the same thing, you know, over and over and over. And look, we're still at the same place. He says, I want you to come here and just look and say, you know, if you think something that's crazy, I want you to come and tell me and talk to me about it. And he says, maybe in the end, we'll just say, no, that's really crazy and not let's do that. But he thought that what was going to happen was going to sound crazy because uh, it, it was going to be something outside of the box. And that's what he wanted. He wanted somebody to think differently than what we were, had been thinking because it just got us back to the same place and the same place and the same place. And so I had a really a good relationship with, um, uh, with admirals and, and, and people in the Coast Guard that I worked with. And uh, I just had a really great time. I never could imagine that I would be working for the Coast Guard, you know, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, it, are, are my conversations different than um, I, I'd like to think that I've changed since from the guy who was, uh, you know, trying to tell you some, give you a story that wasn't, you know, just to give you a story, um, to where that experience of not speaking and those, the, the time of being in that altered reality uh, has, has allowed me uh, to listen and, and to be a part of the solution uh, our communication, things that, that I discovered when one, just one story, um, when I didn't speak, I had a class. I taught a class. Uh, I was a TA in, in Montana, and we were natural human, human resources of the state of Montana after the lecture, and I was a discussion. Okay, so now I, I was uh, in this course, in the class, and I'm the discussion, the TA, the leader of the discussion. And... Um, I would uh, make all kinds of crazy signs and, you know, and they would come around and they gathered and they'd say, oh, he's talking about this. And people really paid attention. Um, and, and, and sometimes I would mean sort of what they were saying. And sometimes I didn't mean that at all, but I wish I did <laughs> because uh, what they were saying were like, you know, I was, that's, yeah, yeah. And so communication was not like I realized it wasn't so, you said A and someone said A and that was it. It was sort of like uh, we started off with a, a, a kind of an alphabet and we kind of came together and we just agreed at some place that, yeah, that works. And we just both agreed on it. And that was the, the best thing that happened in communication when, when we would just agree on, on something. Because I might make a, a sign and I might go, um, this is, I use this a lot. It was like, we're cutting down a tree and everybody comes up with like, well, is that uh, selective forestry? Is it clear cutting? And, and it's like, I'm, I didn't mean any of those things uh, or I did, or I could have. And so what, what can I accept as something I meant? And what can that other person bring to this conversation that, it, that we agree on? And that was like, um, just a really nice, sweet part of what communication could be and how we could bring one side from, a, you know, one side from one way, we're all the way over here, 
and one side all the way over here to, to, to bring us together to be able to talk to each other and understand each other. So, yeah, I think it, it has a profound effect on me. Can you hear me through my mask? Yeah. Okay. It seems like you came across a lot of judgment and negativity for your off the wall decisions. And especially during your journey, it seems like you came across people who just couldn't understand why you were doing what you did. Um, but you seem to have such an optimistic outlook on specifically America. And I'm curious sort of what that optimism is, is rooted in and how you have stayed positive with, you know, experiencing all that judgment. Yeah, um, and that's a, a, a good question. I think we were on a walk later earlier today and someone talked about that, maybe Sean talked to, asked about people who were, who were saying, hey, you, that, that's crazy what you're doing. You shouldn't do that. And, and, it, and it, take, it has taken me a little ways to get to this place. At first it was like, um, I'm just, I'm just going to put up with, I'm just going to hear it, I'm just going to listen to it. But at, this, at some point understanding, well, wait a minute, this is really happening. So why is it happening? Why and and what is coming out of it? And what I what what I got out of that was that it's really important for people to disagree with you. You know, it's it's really important for people to say, John, you shouldn't do that. You know, Sean, what do you what do you think of doing that for? That's you know, and if you say, Oh, okay, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't be doing that. But it's something that you can put yourself up against to define what it is and who it is you are. And so the role that that person is playing and the role that is being played for you is an important part of your development into, into your recognition and being who you are and finding your, yourself, your true self. And it didn't, that didn't, you know, I wish I had had that when I was a little kid, you know, when I was living at home with my parents and I just go, yes, <laughs> I see <laughs> you're trying to, you know, I didn't. I mean, it's something that came over, over time. Um, but uh, I really appreciate that people just didn't, you know, fall over and say, well, that's great, John, what you're doing. Because then it's like, huh? <laughs> You know, if, if you're not making anybody uncomfortable at what you're doing, you're probably not doing, not mean much. You know, if everybody likes you, everybody likes what you're doing, you're like going, wait a minute, am I doing anything that means anything? You know, so. So uh, Sarah Johnson is asking, can you talk about your experience as an African-American man in the late 60s doing your radical act of walking silently across America? So I got all of that except the, the first part of the question. Yeah, well, I think I... <laughs> Um, number one, I think I, I've mentioned something about it that with, with a, somebody putting a, a, a gun to my head and not to say that that's what happened all the time. In fact, that's not what, that's not what happened all the time. Um, it was almost just the opposite of that. That was, that was the rare thing that happened, but it was one of those things that I had to decide whether I was going to keep going or not because, um, it frightened me. And, uh, and then I, I went down to a river and I, I camped out at this river. I didn't build a fire because I was afraid death was going to find me. And um, I listened to a loon. And that loon, the sound of a loon, is what calmed me and, and, and let me reflect on what had taken place and that, you know, death is going to find you. <laughs> 
I mean, anyway, where, wherever you go, and that you might as well be living who you are and being who you are than not, because death is going to find you anyway. You know, and so uh, there was a part of being an African American where I just, it, many times I lost that. I lost that I was just, I was just a person and people were just people. And, and then sometimes I'd be reminded again, but then I would, again, I'd be, I would lose those feelings. I'd be in the forest. I would be just walking. I'd be playing music. I'd be listening to the, to nature. And, and then eventually I would get that back again. So yeah, I, you know, it, the world hasn't changed that much, um, but I, I do have an idea of uh, how we, we can change and why we are in the place that we are. And, and it's not, I mean, it's like we're, we're working on the environment when we need to work on everything. If we're an environmentalist, we're like, we got to work on the whole thing. We can't just work on one little part. We have to work on all of us and, and how we relate to each other. And, and it's not almost, it's like we can't even write about it. You can write about it, but we have to do it. You know, each of one of us has, has to do it and do the work. And, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but it will happen. You know, it will happen if, if we act, if we act in that way if we act that we know that we are connected. You know, it's, you know, it's not like in the, oh yeah, environment, everything's connected. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything is connected. We're all connected, you know? And, and that's something that as environmentalists, as, as human beings, we have to start living. We have to start living. And, um, what is your moment of obligation, your agency? You know, it's something that's going to happen. You know, it's going to, and it, if it happens and you miss it, it'll happen again. I hope, hopefully it'll happen again. So uh, just keep your eyes and your ears open and your heart wide open for that moment. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Except for my question, uh, I do have one final question for you. Uh, for most speakers, I don't think this would be a necessary question, but John, you're a different kind of speaker. Uh, what's next? What's next? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Sleep. <laughs> I, I've been uh, really uh, trying to catch up on my sleep since I got here. <laughs> but um, next, I go back to. Uh, to New Jersey, and I'm a, I'm a uh, commissioner in the little borough that I live in. It's a, a very small borough, and I'm an elected official. Um, there's three commissioners that uh, take care of the potholes and the, you know, the, um, I'm, I'm the police, the commissioner of police and the fire department and the environment on the environmental commission. And we just try to, in the little borough that we have, try to make it easy for people to live and you know, try to love each other. We have, when COVID strikes, we want people to be safe and we, we want everybody to wear a mask and wash their hands. And at all our meetings were, or used to be all Zoom, but now we can have a few people in our, uh, and have, ver and, you know, in, in, in face, face to face meetings, which has been really uh, a good thing for us. So uh, after that, uh, I have two sons that, um, are various degrees of development. One is 14 and one is 20. And um, I got to work with them. And uh, I'm working on a project called Planet Lawns, um, making uh, walking uh, and the using walking as a platform for learning and using the technology that we have. I think we're, we did something today, uh, a, a small walk, a 30 minute walk with one of your students. Or, Shay Garcia, she's a sophomore in the uh, in Sustainability and Re Resilience Program. And uh, we want to use, uh, we're building this community of walkers all over the world so that 
uh, we can share each other's journeys and, and see where we can get to from here. So that's what's next. And that's what's happening now. Yeah. And, and maybe I'll know, learn another banjo tune that I can play for you guys the next time I come. Thank you everybody for coming. I had passed around a sign in sheet too for anybody if you want to just make sure you initial next to that so you get credit for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.